Hello Sorry. and welcome to our last episode of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa for May 2021. I can't quite believe how quickly this year is flying by. I'm your host, Melissa Whitecross, and it is great to be back on your screens tonight. Tonight's episode is going to give us an incredible overview of South Africa's only endemic parrot, the Cape Parrot, and will showcase the conservation and research work being carried out by our dedicated BirdLife Species Guardians, the Cape Parrot Project, which is represented by Dr. Kate and Cassie Carstens, and the Cape Parrot Working Group, represented by Professor Colleen Downs this evening. But before we hear from them, I need to let our audience know that they can communicate with us using the Zoom chat room, and questions for our speakers can be posted into the Q&A box throughout this webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions, and our speakers will answer these at the end of the webinar. We're on most of the major social media platforms, so get in touch with us using the hashtag Conservation Conversations to let us know that you're tuning in. If you've missed any of our previous episodes, they are available on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel and our podcast. We'd like to ask all of you to please subscribe to our YouTube channel to help us grow support for this webinar content. Now, BirdLife South Africa is proud to produce this weekly webinar series, but it does not run without its costs. If you are enjoying the series and have found the content interesting and entertaining, why not consider dropping us a small donation towards our ongoing efforts to bring you new and exciting content that is free for all to learn and enjoy. Simply scan the Quicket QR code on screen or visit our Conservation Conversations website to find the link to the donations tab. We are extremely grateful to all of you who have supported these webinars so far. BirdLife South Africa's Conservation League donor competition is back and all existing and new members who join our organization as a Conservation League donor before 31 August 2021 will be entered into the draw to win a four night stay at Zamunga Private Game Reserve in Northern KwaZulu-Natal for two people. Show your commitment to giving conservation wings and you can win. Contact our membership team to find out more about this exciting competition. And now on to some of our upcoming events. This weekend, BirdLife South Africa's 92nd AGM will be taking place and we invite you to join the virtual flock on 29 May at 10 a.m. South African Standard Time. We'll be presenting the Gill Memorial Medal to one of South Africa's top ornithologists, as well as making one or two surprise announcements alongside the regular agenda and annual report. To register for this important event, please visit the Flock page under the events tab on our website or email flock2021 at birdlife.org.za. And straight after the AGM, you can join wildlife photographer Andrew Averly and Canon South Africa for the lab photography workshop taking place from one o'clock to three o'clock South African Standard Time. This two hour workshop will showcase tips and tricks for improving your birding photography. And Andrew will share some of his tales from his travels across South Africa. There are still tickets available and the deadline for registrations on Quicket ends on 28th May. The link to register will be available in the chat room after this introduction and can also be found on our lab webpage. Tickets are just 250 Rand per person and attendees who have also registered for the lab conference will qualify for the lucky draw to win a Canon sponsored prize. For more information, please email lab2021 at birdlife.org.za. Now you'll notice a virtual theme at BirdLife South Africa as we navigate the continued COVID-19 impacted world, but we're excited to announce that our virtual African bird fair is making a return to your screens. And this year it's set to take place on 30 and 31 July, 2021. So for those of you in the Southern Hemisphere where it is pretty chilly during those periods, you can stay indoors and browse all of the exciting virtual content that will be on offer. Be sure to watch BirdLife South Africa's media channels to find out more. BirdLife South Africa's annual jackpot birding is back where you stand a chance to win a 100,000 Rand cash prize with an additional three prizes valued at 10,000 Rand each. Entry into the draw is only 500 Rand with just 1,000 tickets up for grabs. Those are pretty good odds if you ask me. Now all proceeds will be going towards giving conservation wings with over half the tickets already sold. So be sure to bag your chance to win this exciting prize by visiting the BirdLife South Africa website and purchasing your ticket before 19 November, 2021. The draw will be taking place on 23 November and we will announce the winners on our various media platforms. BirdLife South Africa is excited to announce our weekend bush breakaway with eco-training in the Makuleki concession. 
Situated in the northern extreme of Kruger National Park, the Makuleki is considered one of the best, if not the best, locations to bird in South Africa, with specials like racket-tailed roller, pulse fishing owl, Arno's chat, and three-banded courses. The weekend of 13 to 16 August is now open for bookings and will cost you a mere 5,400 Rand per head for three nights inclusive of all board and lodging, as well as activities. For bookings and inquiries, please email projects at ecotraining.co.za. Now, lastly, a call to action. The largely intact grasslands in the proposed Upper Vilka protected environment of the Eastern Free State near Harry Smith hosts many threatened bird species and other animals. It is also a very important water catchment area, assisting with the provision of clean water to Gauteng. Please help us to protect this beautiful area by signing the support letter on BirdLife South Africa's website. The link is now on screen and we'll also post this in the chat box and the Facebook live chat box shortly. It'll only require you adding your name, surname and email address at the end of the letter before pressing submit. Your support is greatly appreciated and many people ask us how they can get involved in conservation. This is the perfect time for you to do just that. But now onto tonight's main event. The endangered Cape Parrot has seen some difficult decades of late. However, through the combined forces of the BirdLife Species Guardians, for the Cape Parrot, there is hope on the horizon for this endemic parrot and its mist belt forest home. Tonight we're joined by Dr. Kate Carstens of the Cape Parrot Project and Professor Colleen Downs of the Cape Parrot Working Group. Both Kate and Colleen are the current co-chairs of the Cape Parrot Action Plan Coordination Committee, which is a national plan to drive the conservation of this species and its habitat. Kate graduated from the Fitzpatrick Institute at the University of Cape Town in 2017 with a PhD that investigated the role of nest boxes as a conservation tool for the Southern Ground Hornbill. Her next role saw her join the Cape Parrot Project to apply her knowledge on the endangered Cape Parrot, a species that, like the Southern Ground Hornbill, also suffers from a shortage of natural nesting sites. She's also currently the Africa co-chair for the Parrot Researchers Group. Kate is based in Hogsback with her husband, Cassie, and together they are driving research and conservation efforts of the Cape Parrot Project. Now presenting alongside Kate this evening is one of South Africa's leading ladies of ornithology, Professor Colleen Downs. Colleen has been based at the University of KwaZulu-Natal since the mid-1994 and is now based at the Peter Maritzburg campus of UKZN. She holds an NRF Saatchi Research Chair in Ecosystem Health and Biodiversity in KwaZulu-Natal and the Eastern Cape. Her diverse research interests include conservation, ecology, physiology and behavior of terrestrial vertebrates, which include things like herps, birds and mammals in unpredictable environments with changing land use. Colleen was BirdLife South Africa's honorary president from 2016 to 2020. She is an honorary fellow of the International Ornithological Union and the American Ornithological Union. Her hobbies include bird watching and bird banding. And it is a privilege to have both of you on the show tonight. We look forward to hearing your talk this evening and I'd like to ask each of you just to say hello to our audience while I load up your talk this evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Kate and Cole. Over to you. Right. Hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us. Just wanted to say a big shout out and thanks to you, Melissa, and to BirdLife South Africa for hosting us tonight. And I really look forward to spending the next hour with you all. Thanks very much. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for making time to join. Hopefully, we'll teach you something about Cape Parrots this evening, and a big thank you to BirdLife for hosting us. Thank you both so much. We will chat to you after this incredible presentation, and I hope that everybody enjoys. If you travel inland from the eastern coast of South Africa, you will eventually encounter some mountains. And in most cases, these will have slopes covered in thick forests. These indigenous forests occur along the eastern parts of the country, fragmented like a string of pearls stretching from the central Eastern Cape province across KwaZulu-Natal and into Limpopo. Afro-Montane forest, indigenous forest, southern mistbelt forest, they have many different classifications and names. These forests are known for their towering yellow woods and raging waterfalls, all of which warrant entire documentaries of their own. Today, however, we are more interested in one of the avian residents, the Cape Parrot, 
South Africa's only endemic parrot. Poikephalus robustus. Poikephalus from the Greek kephalos for head and poios for of what kind, based on the fact that the 10 species that belong to this genus all have different head coloration. The robustus part is easy, robust, large, referring to their body size and their very large and strong bull. Capes have a body length of 30 centimeters and weigh between 250 and 350 grams, with the males being slightly larger than the females. They have ivory colored bulls, olive brown heads, bright green bodies and dark green almost black wing and upper back feathers. There is slight color dimorphism between the sexes. The fronds or foreheads of the males are usually black, whilst those of the females have some orange. Nestlings and young birds also have orange, but males would lose this color after a few months post-fledging. Adult birds have orange on their epaulets or wings around the alula, as well as on the lower legs. Nestlings and very young birds have white epaulets, which disappear during the immature phase. The zygodactyl feet are gray in color and heavily scaled. Remember those forests we mentioned earlier? Well, that's where these birds are typically found. They currently occur in three of South Africa's provinces. You will immediately notice the color differences in the distribution map. Those are based on the data from the South African Bird Atlas project, with the light gray representing the first large survey from 1987 to 1991, and the dark gray representing the second and current survey, which started in 2007. There's a large population in the Amatola Mountains of the Eastern Cape, and a smaller one in the mountains to the west of Ntata. Note the lack of dark grey here. We know very little about the current status of this population, but speculate that they might still move to the coast around Port St. John's. The next large population is in KwaZulu-Natal, concentrated around Bulver, Boston and Crichton in the Midlands. From there, it is quite a gap to the northernmost and geographically isolated population in the Machubas Kluwe and Volkberg, to the west of Sanin in Limpopo. How many Cape parrots are there, I hear you ask? Well, I'll have to keep you in suspense for a while longer, since this will be covered by Professor Colleen Downs a little bit later in this presentation. But I'll give you a hint. Fewer than the black rhino that everyone got so worked up about a few years ago. In the meantime, let's cover their basic ecology. The high altitude forests between 1,000 and 1,700 meters above sea level are very important, since that is where the parrots like to roost and nest. Most of their food sources are also found here, with two trees that literally stand out. The real yellowwood, Podocarpus latifolius, South Africa's national tree, and the Otoniqua yellowwood, Podocarpus or Afrocarpus falcatus, the tallest tree species in the country. If food sources are limited, Cape parrots can make long foraging journeys away from the forests, sometimes flying more than 100 kilometers in a day. Many of the textbooks, field guides and information on Cape parrots describe them as specialized foragers, suggesting that they only eat the fruit from these two yellowwoods. This is not the case. They are specialized with regards to the part of the fruit or seed that they eat, the inner kernel. Parrots are generally described as messy eaters, and it is truly the case here. They remove and discard the outer fruit layer, crack the seed and then consume that innermost part. So far, more than 50 tree and plant species both indigenous and exotic, have been identified as food sources across their distribution range. This doesn't mean that the yellowwoods aren't important though. In the Amatola Mountains, we have found a possible link between nesting and fruit availability. If the yellowwoods are fruiting, we hope for a busy breeding season. Breeding takes place during the spring and summer months, with mating observed in the wild as early as July and August. Cape parrots are secondary cavity nesters, relying on a cavity made by a primary nester, such as woodpeckers or barbets, or a cavity that develops naturally in hollows or from branch breakages. Parrots are also facultative cavity nesters, meaning that they are able to modify the cavity to a certain extent by enlarging the cavity and its opening and deepening the nest. Most of the nests that have been identified are in tall Otoniqua yellowwoods, both living and dead. Eggs are laid asynchronously and clutches range from two to five eggs. The female incubates for roughly 30 days with food being supplied by the male. Nestlings remain in the nest for approximately 70 days during which both male and female provide food to the chicks. 
Chicks fledge individually over the course of a week or so, and the short parental care period is followed by the youngsters joining large juvenile flocks. We do need to cover the three main threats that Cape parrots face, but don't worry, you'll soon hear how we are working to protect and conserve the birds and the forest habitat that they depend on. The loss of that habitat, combined with current and historical logging, has had a very negative impact on the parrots. Like so many other species, they have to rely on fewer and diminished forests for both food and nesting sites. That prized yellowwood dressing table you inherited from your great-great-grandparents? The tree it came from might have contained a Cape Parrot nest. Poaching for the pet trade is still a problem, with injuries inflicted during the catching event often being fatal if the bird is lucky, or resulting in broken wings and amputations if the bird is not. And finally, something that we can all currently relate to, disease. Cytosine beak and feather disease virus is present in Cape Parrot populations throughout the country, and the severity of the disease is linked with climatic extremes. During years of extreme drought and lack of food, this immune-suppressing disease will cause loss of feathers and cracked beaks, and is almost always fatal. There is no vaccine. But not all is lost. Like their scientific name suggests, these are robust and hardy birds. And in a few moments you will hear of the groups of scientists, conservationists and representatives of government agencies that are working to save our national parrot by clearing invasive plants and planting indigenous trees, conducting annual population counts, working with local communities and supplementing nesting sites. Thanks for watching and stay tuned. Good day everyone. I'll speak very briefly about the Cape Parrot and some of the work we've been doing, especially the Cape Parrot Day, and from a point of view of the Cape Parrot Working Group mainly. I'm always amazed that most people don't realize that Africa has parrots and that South Africa has its own endemic parrot, the Cape Parrot, Hoekiflis robustus, it's a cousin of the African grey, and they're a similar size. The Cape parrot used to have a number of subspecies, and these have now been separated. So you get the brown-necked in West Africa, the grey-headed, which you can see in Kruger and Zimbabwe especially, and then the Cape parrot, you can see the blue distribution at the bottom. It's more on our eastern seaboard. Our bird guides recognized the separate species quite a while ago, but it was only in 2015 after we published on the genetics that the international recognition came for a separate species for the Cape Parrot. And again, you can see the distribution highlighted differs between the two. But there are also morphological and ecological differences. So the female Cape Parrot is a more attractive one. She's got red above the bill. The work was started by Olaf Wormenhaus who's, as part of his PhD. Um, sadly, he passed away from brain, brain cancer and Craig Symes and I completed it. However, the person who initiated all the research on African parrots was Mike Perrin, and he had the foresight to do this. Our southern misbelt forests are really special. Um, the forest biome is one of the smallest in South Africa, and it is not continuous forest. It's made up of patches within the landscape mosaic, and yellowwoods are the dominant species. And if the forests weren't there, we wouldn't have parrots. And so we often say that the Cape Parrot is a flagship species for the conservation of these special misbelt forests. The misbelt forests go right up north and in the area around Machubus Kloof and Volkberg, we have a relic population of Cape Parrots. Historically, they extended down the escarpment all the way to KZN, but now they're a disjunct population. 
and the population of cat parrots is mainly in KZN from around Kharkiv down to the Amatolas in the Eastern Cape and a little bit along the coast, especially in the former Transkei. The black indicates the forest patches. So these parrots are strong flyers and they fly between the patches mainly for food and so we call them food nomadics. And historically, longer trips were documented of them going to the coast, especially in the summer months. That mainly happens around Amtata to Port St. John's now, and a little bit around East London. So one of their favorite foods or fruits are the yellowwood fruit. And with that strong bill, they're one of the few bird species that can open up the fruit and get to the kernel in the middle. And Afrocarpus falcatus is particularly favoured, but they do feed on the others as well. Obviously, yellowwoods don't fruit all year round, and at other times of the year, the caps have to feed on other species. And here they're seen feeding on an olea. Um, similar to cultus, this has very small fruits, and the parrots eat them like peanuts getting rid of the exocarp and then eating the kernel in the middle. At other times they'll feed on erythrina or outside of forests on pecanuts or other fruits. Importantly, they feed on the heads of proteas or the seed heads. And so it makes it clear that the proteas in the grasslands next to forests also need to be conserved because they provide the parrots with food at certain times of the year. Sometimes you'll see kept parrots away from forest in eucalypts, pecanuts, etc. They also need to drink daily and so will fly between patches, especially in drought times when they have to fly to a forest that perhaps has some water still trickling over the edge of a cliff and they'll come down. They're very cautious because for predators. So they typically are loud and conspicuous. That is if you're near a forest early in the morning because they're active around dawn till about nine o'clock. Often in the middle of the day, they just sit in the trees and then they're active again later afternoon. But that changes if it's a misty day, they might fly around much more on a misty day. And then they fly around either, either singles, pairs or family groups of up to five. And then at a feeding site, there might be many birds and they give the false impression that they're abundant. In terms of breeding, we call them secondary cavity nesters. They rely on something else making a cavity in a tree. Um, they lay two to five eggs and they only breed from four to six years of age. So it is very important that adult birds aren't removed from the population. So when we model it, we see the numbers decline quite quickly then. These secondary cavities are typically in yellowwoods in the forest. And a dead old yellowwood is, or dead tree is called a snag. Occasionally a branch breaks off and makes a cavity as well. So when we started the work, we said that there were five major threats to Cape parrots. However, we've now increased it to seven and the two additional ones we've added are climate change and the wood borer, which we don't know much about at this stage. And so I'll just briefly talk through these. So the loss of pristine habitat, in some areas these forests have been totally removed 
other areas they were heavily logged by pioneers, so the quality has changed. And in other areas, there continues to be ring barking for the muti trade and removal of firewood. So that all impacts the habitat. Obviously, if the trees are gone, then there's less food available and the birds seem to have to go and feed on exotics, particularly in drought years. Um, we see them feeding more in syringa and black wattle in drought years. So if there are fewer snags, it means less nest sites. The other thing that the cape parrots use these snags for is in the early morning to sun themselves and we're not sure how much information they commun communicate to one another, say about food sources. The next is disease, which is a difficult thing to measure as you don't find a pile of dead birds. And this beak and feather virus seems to particularly affect juveniles, but they don't die from feathers falling out. It's normally from secondary um, infection. Again, it's more in drought years that they seem to exhibit symptoms more often. Sadly, with us humans, when something becomes rare, we want it and we want like stamp collecting. And there is some illegal trade of Cape parrots, but we try and monitor it. The Cape Working Group has a stud book and Sean Wilkinson's in charge of that. And one of the main things then is to monitor the captive bred Cape parrots. And it is hoped that, that one can flood the market and then avoid taking birds out the wild. The non-human predators are also difficult to assess, but there has been an increase in black sparrow hawks with forestry and people report seeing them chasing parrots. Another one in recent years are the crows, especially pied crows, that chase the parrots. So in 1990, people said there were at least a thousand Cape parrots left. And that's when Olaf started the work in 1992. Then in 1998, what we decided was to start the Cape Parrot Big Birding Day, because us as researchers might go to a forest one day and see no parrots and the next day they're there. So on this day, we try and get citizen science, volunteers, etc., to help us count at all the patches where parrots are known to visit. Um, so this has been going on since 1998. And I can't highlight enough the importance of these citizen scientists and their contributions. And sometimes the weather plays havoc, and so we spread the day over two, an afternoon and a morning. And the three people shown with red here are three of the KZN wildlife guys who've helped me since the beginning in the Kalingenwa area. And on the day, some people see maybe one bird fly over or several single birds. Others are fortunate enough to see them sunning themselves, preening, and sometimes mating. Most of us see them just flying over and can count them as they go. And I always get people to record which direction. So we try and avoid double counting. But sadly, some people see nothing and it's really difficult to really encourage them to go back to a particular forest after they've seen nothing, but these data are very valuable. Some see them outside of forest, especially at pecanuts. And what we're not sure is whether the birds have discovered that pecanuts are, are delicious or whether there's low forest fruit availability. So I highlighted the importance of the null returns and that the weather can play havoc. But what's good is that we are seeing recruitment and that means that the population isn't just in decline. As I mentioned, 
it's not only the citizen scientists that are important, but it's also the local coordinators in this national count. And Malcolm Gimmel from Crichton, and then several people from the Amtata area, and then also the Hogsback area, have been real stalwarts in counting year in and year out. And many of the other coordinators as well have helped for many, many years, and I'm most grateful. From this, we get a lot of indication of which forests the Cape parrots are visiting and what they're doing and where they're moving outside of forests. We then map that and we can see the importance of the former trans sky from the parrot days. And if we look at the SABAP data, we can see that less birders are going to the trans sky. And so I try and encourage people to also record their observations um, using bird lasso. So the question then, after all these years of counting, how many Cape parrots are there? And in 2014, we did a summary and we said about 1,600. Last year, we weren't able to do total count because of the COVID restrictions. But in 2019, we had at least 1,800 Cape parrots seen in the wild, which is the highest in recent years. And if we look and we divide the population into the southern Amatola, there's about definitely 500 there, but a max around 950. I'm tighter, central area A, about 300, but we've had up to close on 500. Then Gailey Crichton area, about 450, but we've had up to 650. And then the northern relic population, the mean is about 53, but we have seen up to 100. So looking at this overall, there are at least 1,300 Cape parrots in the wild, but based on 2019, I would say probably closer to 1,800. Big question, should we continue with parrot days? I think very definitely because we get other outcomes as well, distribution of Samanga, ground hornbill. And I think people realize how important it is to conserve these forests and address issues such as hunting and logging. Many people also write to me about their experiences and they were really grateful for the opportunity to be in these forests and to make a contribution. This year's Parrot Day, we had to observe COVID protocols. And these are some of the students that went from UKZN to the Ngeli area. We also have a range of postgrads that are doing other forest work, looking at the mammals and bird species of these misspelled forests across the landscape. Over the years, we've got many people to thank, and I'm grateful to them all. Actually, my family, and you can see they've gone from the early parrot days right up until now. So many thanks to them. Next year is a special year, because it will be our 25th Cape Parrot Day. And it's also the year where we're going to host the International Ornithological Congress. Nikki Kerb kindly did the logo using a cat parrot. Thank you. Hello and good evening everyone. Before I pick up from where Cole left off, I just wanted to say a quick thank you to you for tuning in and to BirdLife for hosting us this evening. For the next 10 minutes, I will share with you some stories from the Amatola Mountains, stories about Cape Parrots, the misspelled forest that they call their home, and the work we do to conserve both the species and their habitat. But first I want to tell you briefly about our core areas of focus. Using our acronym CPP slightly differently, communities, plants and parrots sums up what we are all about in three words. 
We at the Cape Parrot Project see ourselves as leveraging the Cape Parrot as a flagship species to conserve the threatened mist belt forests and all the species that call these forests their home, and ensuring that local communities derive benefits by partnering with us to restore forest habitat. We also work to fill key knowledge gaps and work with our partners to mitigate threats to both the species and habitat. Our work is centered around the village of Hogsback, and from here we launch all of our community engagements, habitat restoration activities and research fieldwork, covering a large area within the Catberg Amatola Key Biodiversity Area in the Eastern Cape, circled here in green. To explain about our activities aligned with communities and plants, let me begin with a story about a community near the CPP base in Hogsback called Sumpondo. The community is nestled against a beautiful belt of indigenous misspelled forests. The streams are fed by water that originates in the mountain range behind their village and flows through indigenous forests before reaching them. They are deeply connected to the forests and the freshwater flowing from it. CPP and Zampondo began a partnership in 2014 as a way of generating seedlings for our forest restoration program. Together we built a micro nursery and various community members began growing seedlings of indigenous tree species for us. This started out as individual nurseries, but later expanded into a single large community nursery. Their commitment to us is to grow a range of healthy indigenous seedlings. They pick the seeds from the trees that are fruiting in the forests near them, and sometimes we provide seeds for them if we happen across any seeds fruiting in abundance that doesn't occur near them. Our commitment to Sampondo is to buy back their seedlings when they reach planting height, around 40 centimetres. We do this several times each year and load the seedlings into our bucky and trailer and bring them back to our base in Hogsback ready for planting out at our restoration sites in spring. Our commitment is also to share with them the knowledge and skills to generate healthy compost and we help out where necessary to maintain the nursery and water supply structures. Where they can, the nursery members mend broken fences and repair gutters feeding their nursery rainwater tank and we help out for more expensive tasks such as the nursery expansion to allow more growers to join and benefit from the program. The micro nursery at Sampondo is called Siazama, which in Isikosa means working together. The seedlings grown from Siazama micro nursery are planted back into suitable habitat in the restoration patches where we work. Two years ago, CPP and Sampondo nursery growers together planted their seedlings into the forest behind the village. This was something they had been dreaming of for many years and we were so excited to work together with Sampondo to help make this happen. Over the past few years, through our partnership, we have injected over 182,000 Rand into the community through the seedling buyback scheme. Through planting partnerships like this, we have been able to sequester nearly 80 tonnes of carbon from the atmosphere. It's been an absolute privilege partnering with this community. We are currently in the process of expanding the nursery to allow for the next generation of growers to begin growing with us. Some of them the sons and daughters of the current team of community growers. It's an exciting time of growth and we look forward to partnering with this community for decades to come. The second story I wanted to share with you this evening is all about nest boxes and how conservation interventions can be informed by field research. In 2011, we installed over 200 nest boxes, such as this one, in an attempt to boost the availability of suitable nesting sites. Over time, we monitored these boxes and found that they were rarely occupied by parrots. Bees, mice, other birds, yes, but seldom capes. Several times we found pairs of capes inspecting, like this adult male photographed at the nest entrance, but we didn't have any signs that they'd ever used the boxes for nesting, despite inspecting these nests for over a decade. Since then, we've been building a clearer picture of what Cape parrots think of as prime real estate by studying their natural nesting sites. This takes a lot of hard work, walking every inch of forest in what is often very steep terrain. It's pretty tough going, carrying all the tree climbing equipment and nest monitoring tools such as cameras, GPSs, binoculars, notebooks, waterproof gear and food. Check out this video of a pair making modifications to their cavity. It's messy business as the pair chews and works away at deepening and widening the cavity inside.
Cassie Carstens, our research manager, uses rope access techniques to access several nesting cavities and found them to be fairly deep inside, sometimes over a metre deep, and often positioned over 15 metres above the ground. He found that their natural nests were also lined with wood chips that the pair chewed off from inside the cavity. We used drones and pole cameras to carefully inspect cavities and trees that he couldn't safely access. We have also identified possible nest predators, namely the African harry hawk and Samanga monkey, which we have filmed at nest entrances. Here is a video showing an Africa harry hawk trying its luck. From this knowledge of natural nesting sites, we are looking at making suitable and necessary modifications to our existing nest box design to create something that parrots would use successfully, mimicking as closely as possible what we have observed in nature. These changes include making the cavity deep enough to be inaccessible by suspected nest predators, and thick-walled so that the pair can chew the interior to their delight to create their desired lining and positioned high in the canopy, and better still if it's within a close distance to other known nests, since active and successful natural nests occur in these loose colonies. Location, location, location. Cass and I have explored the forests on foot and from the skies, looking for and finding perfect forest giants in which to position them. Construction of nest boxes is currently underway, and the new set of boxes will be installed this year. This nest box project will be thinking long term. Each year, monitoring occupancy and breeding success and slowly developing an understanding as to whether or not the modifications have worked. It can take decades. Parrots are extremely long-lived and are therefore not inclined to breed every year, so monitoring of breeding success needs to be ongoing and requires a committed effort for many years. Similarly, our restoration work is thinking long-term. It takes over a century to restore a forest. The trees we plant today or tomorrow we likely won't live to see turn into a recovered forest. But what we want is for, during our time, to make significant steps towards achieving this, and to set things up when the time comes for the next generation to continue. This is our lifelong commitment. So thank you to the audience for joining us this evening, and thank you too to our partners in the Wild Bird Foundation of America, AVAX, Green Pop, the Rufford Foundation, Wildlife Acoustics, and many, many others for their continued support, who together ensures that we can carry on doing what we do every day. We are active on various social media platforms, so do like and follow us there, and please do visit our website should you wish to read more about us and to donate. Thanks, and please drop us an email should you wish to know more. Kate, that was absolutely phenomenal. Thank you so much. And thank you to Colleen and Cassie as well for their incredible contributions to that presentation. It is just phenomenal to see how much work conservation research is going into these amazing birds. And a massive thank you to all of you for such good efforts in bringing us that wonderful webinar. I certainly learned a lot about these kernel crunching parrots this evening. So thank you both so much for that. Before we dive into some questions, just a reminder to everyone tuning in, you can ask your questions in the Zoom Q&A box or the Facebook Live comment feed. And I'd like to remind everyone that as you exit tonight's webinar, there is a post-webinar survey. It takes just two minutes to fill in, so please do take that time to share your thoughts with us. Next week, Joe Grossel will share the next episode in our Sand Park series. So be sure to join us for the beautiful Mapungubwe National Park. And to kick us off with questions, I'm going to pose this one to Colleen. Um, Eleanor Mary Cattle is asking, why are there no Cape parrots in the Yellowwood forests of Nisner and the Western Cape? So, Cole, if you wouldn't mind joining me on screen. And Kate, you're welcome to unmute and stick your video on as well. Let's kick off with that question, please. I think it's unfortunate that they were called Cape parrots. It was when they were first discovered way back in the mid 1700s, when the whole of South Africa was known as the Cape. From the museum specimens that we've examined, both overseas and in South Africa, there were none further south um, than the Amatolas. And what we see for several mammal and bird species 
is there's a cutoff and we, it's linked to temperature and probably also um, they've got good sense not to have to put up with the winter rainfall down in the Cape. Although those forests are dominated by yellowwoods, they might not provide food at the other times of the year as well. So there's several reasons why they probably never occurred further south than the Amatolas. Thanks, Cole. Very comprehensive answer there. And uh, this next one's for, for Kate, and it's from Robert Smith. And he's saying, to his knowledge, the forestry authorities seem to follow a policy of removing the senile trees. Has there been any coordination with these authorities to emphasize that this is not good for parrots? And hopefully to a degree, this will also answer Eleanor and Andre's questions from earlier. Andre's question was very similar to that of Eleanor Mary's. So over to you, Kate. Yeah, hi, um, Robert, that's a great question. We've been working a lot with the Department of um, Forestry regarding this exact question. And in fact, we had a workshop with forestry recently and it was to discuss the importance of keeping senile trees in the forest habitat because of the um, role that they play in the ecosystem. Uh, we've also just published a study, Jessica Lever, our conservation um, landscape conservation manager just published, uh, looking at which trees should be removed if they can um, to have the least amount of impact um, on Cape parrot nesting sites because there seems to be an overlap of nest sites, um, the yellow woods that are suitable for nesting sites and yellow woods that are suitable for harvesting. Um, and so we're working closely with, with the Department of Forestry on this at the moment. And um, yeah, we've got a, a great relationship with forestry in our area. And um, so, yeah, we're definitely coordinating our, our efforts there between themselves and us for sure. Thanks so much, Kate. And I see you've got one from Rob Simmons. And Cole, I'm going to start you off with this one because he's specifically speaking about KZN. But once Cole's given her answer, Kate, you're welcome to pitch in as well because I know the Eastern Cape farmers also speak to this. Rob's asking what the reactions of the nut growers in KZN is to the Cape parrots in their orchards. And do you see a lot of persecution of these parrots? So Cole, if you'll kick us off, please. Um, in Kezadin, they especially in the areas where the forests occur, the pecanuts haven't been grown on a commercial basis. And it tends to be um, farmhouses with a couple of trees or, or a small orchard. Mm -hmm. And most people have tolerated the parrots um, eating the top pecanuts. <laughs> but in some areas, we do know that the birds get shot when they come and feed on the pecans. Um, so what we try and stress to people is that if the birds can mainly just take a little bit of the crop and let it be a win-win situation. Thanks, Cole. Kate, would you like to add anything to that from the Eastern Cape? Yeah, I can. Thanks, Melissa. So we've been working quite closely with the pecan growers around the Amatola, specifically um, around Ellis, the town of Ellis, which is 30 kilometers south of Hogsback, and also the town of Fort Beaufort, which is a little bit to the southwest. And we've got an excellent working relationship um, with the growers, the, the pecan growers. Luckily, one of the orchards that we see a lot of the Cape parrots at is in Ellis, and it's an orchard that's uh, managed through the University of Fort Hare. Um, and the other orchard is um, a, a, a farmer, and we've got really good working relationships with him and he allows the Cape parrots to forage to their delight at the orchard. And we use that as one of our uh, locations where we view the parrots every, every week this time of the year. In fact, they're flocking there at the moment in quite a lot of numbers, which is positive to see. And yeah, we hope that the positive relationship continues with the, with the farmers. Fantastic. And I see we've got a comment here from Leonard Erickson saying that back in 1977, he visited a farm just outside of King Williamstown and spent time with some pecan nut farmers. And in his words, the orchard was darkened um, as the hundreds of parrots descended upon it. And uh, we, we certainly hope that uh, those big flocks will continue to fly around in the future. Um, but moving on to another question here from Mark. 
Um, and Kate, you spoke about your Nest Box project and what, what all you're doing to try and improve the designs. And I know you had some good success uh, during your time with the Southern Ground Hornbills. But Mark is asking, it's taken a long time to figure out why your bird boxes weren't working and being taken over by things like bees. Um, are you finding that bats are also potentially using these boxes? And besides your, your improvements that you are making, what else is there to try to make sure that the birds do ultimately use them? Right, yeah, so um, lots to answer there. So I think when you look at nesting boxes and particularly when, you, when you're working with a species that's so long lived, like the Cape Parrot, we don't wanna to be too quick to rule out the possibility of a nest box design working. So what Colleen found in KZN was that it took a decade for the Cape Parrots to find the nest boxes and to occupy them, which was quite interesting. So even though it looked like for 10 years, the boxes weren't successful, after 10 years, they were occupied. And so you kind of never know how long it's, it's gonna take. And so we wanted to make sure that we were giving our boxes enough time before we decided, right, um, let's try a new design. So we gave it 10 years and um, we could see that there was so little interest in them, very few were inspected by the Cape Parrots and we never saw the nest boxes occupied. So there were never eggs laid inside. And so you could see from the presentation that we're, we're trying different options. We're, we're looking at deepening the cavities so that the female and the chicks inside are safe from the nest predators. If you think of the reach of the African harrier hawk and the Samanga monkey, we wanna make sure that they're, they're out of arm's length. Uh, and we also wanna try and figure out what designs help um, deter bees or to not attract bees in any case. We find that a lot of our boxes are occupied by bees, over 50%. And so we're trying to think of designs where maybe the bees won't be so inclined to, to occupy. And I guess our best shot is to just try and see what works. And, um, but most importantly, to make sure that it's something that a Cape Parrot will feel comfortable to nest in. And, and we just, we know that depth, that, you know, the, the, the deeper the box, the, the more positive it'll be. And the thicker the nest box, the more, the more opportunity the parrot pair has to, to chew uh, to their delight. And we hope that that's a, that's a good start and, and putting them high up in really great um, yellowwood trees in the forests. So we're, we're, we're doing what we can and we cross our fingers and hope for the best. And we'll be watching things closely from the middle of this year when the first boxes go up. Brilliant. Thanks so much for that, Kate. And it, it certainly is great to see just how far this nest box research has come in the last decade. So huge kudos to you and the team that have been working on these. And let's hope the next 10 bring some success stories going forward. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> right, Cole, I'm going to take the next question over to you. Uh, this one's from Graham Addy. And he's asking, he lives in Howick. Um, but hasn't seen many parrots for a long time. And he's asking if there are still birds being observed in the Carcliffe and the Ligeton area. Um, sadly, in the, or in the 1950s, at Ben V near Hawick, um, people used to see over 200 in the garden there. Then by the late 1980s, when we were working in the forests there, we'd see about 20. And then it dropped down till about five. So there's still a few in the area. Um, they mainly move between Ben V and Mbona. And on the parrot day, three people, or rather three birds were seen by people who bird quite regularly in the area and hadn't seen them for a long while. They do seem to move between there and Belgaon as well. So sometimes the, um, there's a kind of more of an abundant group, if I can call it that, in Pecanuts in some of the areas as you look over towards Albert Falls. So sadly, the numbers have declined there. That whole Forest area, especially from Howick through to Ben V, um, the Grey Mare's Tail section, was heavily logged by the pioneers. And a lot of timber went up to the mines. And although the forest looks good, it's there are not many big yellow woods. They tend to be along the streams um, in the deep gullies where the loggers couldn't get to them. 
there are young yellowwoods coming up, but it's going to take a long time before they're providing suitable nest sites and food at certain times of the year to the parrots. Um, yeah, so hopefully I've answered that. Absolutely. Thanks, Carl. And uh, yeah, certainly concerning to see just how quickly these populations can get fragmented and removed from an area. I see Rob Simmons got another one for us. And Kate, I'm going to point this one at you. He's asking whether you could use pecan nuts as a quicker conservation measure to feed the parrots, especially in times of drought, since they presumably grow quicker than, than the yellowwoods. So Kate, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Robert. That's a, a good question. Pecan nuts are considered junk food for Cape parrots. It's almost like a McDonald's for a, a human being. They're quite high in tannins. And what we find is that by the time the parrots are feeding on the pecans, um, they're, they're quite high in fats and high in tannins. So from a health perspective, it's not ideal for, for parrots. But we do have other tree species, indigenous tree species that we are planting in addition to yellowwoods that grow quite quickly. And so when we think of our restoration sites, we're trying to rebuild forests and we're planting such a wide variety of, of tree species. Um, indeed, a lot of, of yellowwoods, but also Celtis africana and you know, red currants. And there's a whole range up to 30 different species that we're planting out. Um, and so we have, luckily, alternatives to pecan nuts that grow quickly um, to try and, and boost the, the diet of the Cape parrots to make sure that we increase the, the percentage of the diet that's, that's indigenous. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, definitely good to, to vary things up. And I like your comparison of pecan nuts to McDonald's for parrots. <laughs> <laughs> Cole, well, you, you mentioned the Pistocene beacon feather disease, and I think Cassie also did in his fa fantastic introductory video. Um, would you mind just telling us whether this disease is present in all the different populations of Cape parrots that you highlighted in your map, please? It does appear that it is across the whole distribution range. Um, it's a windblown virus, so you can check today, and the birds might not have it or exhibit it, but they, tomorrow they might have it. Um, so it's, I think, a little bit like you and I can have TB and not exhibit it until we're stressed. And it seems that the parrots might carry this virus, but when they're stressed by drought or cold, they exhibit it. Um, but there's still a lot of work being done on this virus, not only in South Africa, other parts of the world, like Australia. Um, so I'm definitely not an expert on the disease, but yeah, we, the work is ongoing. Thanks, Colin. And has this been picked up in the captive populations as well? Yes, it has. Um, there was a time when People used to euthanize their birds. But what we've found over the years is that sometimes the juveniles recover and they go from being positive to negative. So it's not a simple story. No, as we've learned through this COVID pandemic, diseases never seem to be. Thanks, Carl. Um, Kate, I'm going to point this question at you. Uh, Daryl van Amerve is saying there was mention that the birds travel up to 100 kilometers per day. Is this total daily travel or would it be likely to travel 100 kilometers in a single morning or evening flight? Can you talk a bit about the, the movements of these birds, please? Yeah, right. It's so interesting when you think about the movement of Cape parrots because the short answer is we actually don't know how far they can travel in a day. It's one of those interesting questions that we want to answer in the, in the coming years. And... The short on, or the long answer is that they can travel far. We know that for sure. They can make an easy trip to Alice in the morning to go feed on pecans, which is 30 kilometers away and back by the afternoon. But we've also heard of parrots showing up in really strange areas, not necessarily close to any known forest patch where they roost um, along the coast, for example. So we do know that they have the capacity to travel far. And probably then if they are far, they might overnight in a place and travel back the next day. But, you know, with um, technology these days, you know, we should and can um, in the future look to use transmitters, GPS devices, tracking devices to um, place on the birds very carefully and start tracking their, 
their movements to understand this better. So we'll hopefully have more accurate and um, you know, specific answers to those kinds of questions in the years to come. Absolutely, and hopefully there are robust devices when you look at what those beaks can do to a, a nut kernel and a GPS transmitter, it's an easy work. <laughs> yeah, so true. <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing that. We have actually, yes, Carl. sorry, we did <laughs> try put transmitters on them, but within a week they chewed them off and we'd put pepper and all sorts of things <laughs> into the house to stop them, but they still chewed them off. Oh my goodness, it really can drive you mad working on some of these curious species that have very uh, sharp beaks. <laughs> but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll figure out a way to follow their movements soon. And uh, thank you both for sharing those insights. All right, I see we have gone eight o'clock and uh, that's normally when we cut things off, but I got one more question and Colleen, I'm gonna give this one over to you. And this is coming through on Facebook Live and it's from Tommy Curley. And Tommy is saying, with the northern population in Limpopo being so geographically isolated from the other populations, is there any evidence of them potentially becoming their own subspecies or even species over time? So, Cole, if you wouldn't mind speaking to that, please. Um, my colleague, Sandy Willows Monroe, would be a much better person to answer that. <laughs> from the genetics work, we can already see that the Amatola group is, so that's why we call it um, the southern group. Um, the northern group as well, genetically, it is slowly um, separating. So over time, yes, we will probably have three different species. Also the vocalizations already are differing slightly even between our Natal and Hogsback birds. So what we find is there isn't so much um, genetic flow between the Mahuba, I mean, the Amatola birds, whereas there is quite a bit between Amtata um, and KZN. And obviously that disjunct population isn't, uh, there isn't much gene flow with the central population. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks, Cole. And uh, I know there is so much more we could showcase tonight about these incredible birds. I think I'm going to have to get the two of you back here in a, a year or two to update us on the progress of the Cape Parrot Action Plan and the work that's being done by both of your groups and the many other individuals to conserve these wonderful parrots and their misbuilt habitats. We are sadly out of time and apologies to everyone who did post questions that we haven't got to. I will share these with our speakers tonight, and if they do have time to email you answers, I'm sure they will happily do so. But uh, from all of us at Conservation Conversations, a massive thank you to our BirdLife Species Guardians for the Cape Parrot, Dr. Kate Carstens and Professor Colleen Downs. This was an absolutely phenomenal webinar and certainly one that will go down as a firm favorite of mine for sure. So thank you both for your time. I'll give you both a moment just to, to thank anyone that you would like to and uh, give you the floor for a few more seconds, starting off with you, Kate. Thanks, Melissa. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting us again and for everybody for joining in. And a big thank you to the CPP team here on the ground in Hogsback. You know, without all of their dedicated hard work, um, none of this would be possible. So thanks to everybody here and to Kirsten and Steve in Cape Town and the rest of the Wild Bird Trust team that's scattered throughout the country and Southern Africa. Uh, thanks to everybody and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you, Kate. And Colleen, over to you. A big thank you to the citizen scientists who've helped us year in and year out with the Parrot Day Counts. Um, uh, we couldn't have done it without you and really encourage you to carry on um, uh, or train other people to help. And then also to all those people who have funded and supported us over the years, many, many thanks. Um, and also just everyone who drops us lines of when they see cat parrots and give us information um, to all birds to fill in the jigsaw of what the birds are doing when. And we're most grateful. Lastly, to BirdLife South Africa, thank you for highlighting such an important bird um, and all the best and thanks to you. Absolutely. Thank you both. And hopefully one day we'll see the Cape Parrot donning that Bird of the Year title. And I'm sure we'll put a motivation for that in in the upcoming years. 
Thank you all so much for joining us. And as Colleen said, our citizen scientists, we thank you on many of these episodes, but I echo that wholeheartedly. We couldn't do it without all of you. To all of you, I will leave the Zoom room running for a couple more minutes if you'd like to pop your comments and uh, any last remarks into the chat box. But do join us next week for our next Sand Parks installment. Joe Grossel's back highlighting Mapungubwe. From all of us here at Conservation Conversations, good night, happy birding, and keep your eyes on the skies. I will see you again next week, Tuesday, same time, same place. Good night, everybody, and thanks for joining us.